everybody, and thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, even today, uh, we know that uh, in Italy, and especially in Rome, uh, all the people are talking about uh, uh, recent uh, regional elections uh, in Emilia-Romagna, but we know as uh, uh, Centro Machiavelli that uh, international relations, uh, especially uh, foreign policy in East Asia, are also very important. So we decided, uh, in collaboration with uh, the Embassy of Japan uh, in Italy, to organize this uh, conference. I am very, we are very delighted to uh, host uh, Professor Shino Watanabe, professor at the Faculty of Global Studies uh, in Tokyo, in uh, Sofia University. Uh, professor Watanabe is, is a, a specialist on uh, Japan-China relations. Uh, today, uh, she, uh, she will talk about uh, uh, the known, the well-known uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and also about uh, the perhaps uh, less known uh, Free Indo-Pacific, another initiative that is at the core of foreign policy of Japan. We are also happy to have uh, today Giulia Pompili uh, from uh, newspaper, Italian newspaper Il Foglio. Uh, she will handle uh, the conference uh, and also uh, handle the Q&A after, after uh, the, the lecture. Uh, by the way, uh, on your table uh, you have uh, a little survey from Embassy of Japan. Uh, we are thankful uh, to you for uh, answering. Uh, I think uh, it is only uh, four or five questions. So I give the floor uh, to Julia for uh, the start, starting the conference, please. Yes, thank you very much to Centro Machiavelli and the Embassy of Japan for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here because um, I don't want to waste time talking about <laughs> my experience and uh, uh, what I'm doing here. I covered East Asia for several times, for several years. And um, the main point, I think that the main point uh, here now is to recognize that 2019 in Italy was the year uh, of uh, East Asia. Uh, everyone recognize uh, uh, the importance of East Asia and the importance of the relation between, uh, between Italy and East Asia. 2019 is not only the year uh, of the Belt and Road, uh, the, uh, of our government sign of the MOU on Belt and Road, but was also the year uh, of entering force uh, of the free trade agreement between EU and Japan. And uh, in January uh, 2020, uh, we recognized that uh, the, 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 um, the market and the exchange between Italy and Japan w is very huge. Uh, and the consequences uh, of the uh, bilateral um, uh, agreement between Italy and China uh, is not the same. Uh, between the, the, the one between EU and Japan. So we have to reflect this on this, and we have to um, also recognize that everything happened in 2019 happened also because uh, a lack of knowledge of our uh, politicians, but also journalists and media and uh, elite people uh, about East Asia and about the relation between Europe and East Asia. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, I give the, the um, time to, to Professor Watanabe for, for, for her speech. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm very delighted to be here to talk about this uh, topic in front of you. And then, um, I, first um, I would like to ask you maybe some more simple questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you have ever been to Japan. four people. So then, how about China? How many of you have been to China? Three, almost three. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, that will give you some kind of idea, you know. But, um, excellent. Um, yes. 
Um, in, in this presentation, I would like to mainly talk about three issues. First one is Sino-Japanese relations. And then like, uh, my point here is to make sure that you know that maybe you might have a different idea on Sino-Japanese relations where we are, but uh, my point is at this moment, I think Sino-Japanese relations has been somewhat sta stable and uh, not necessarily bad. And it's a kind of a, we reach a stage, a new stage that uh, even if we have some kind of structural issues, we can manage to maintain to at a certain level so that uh, we can avoid uh, going out of a spiral. I think now uh, China Japan relations reached at this moment. Of course, there would be many uh, difficult issues, but it's not the way that. Uh, I think we already reached some kind of uh, new stage. That's my first point. And second, I would like to talk about free and open the Pacific. At the same time, of course, I, we are interested in like a Belt and Road Initiative as well. And then I think now uh, what I want to highlight here is that free and open in the Pacific is not a countermeasure against the Belt and Road Initiative. At the beginning, when like Japan um, you know, started this kind of initiative, especially China, somewhat felt it's a kind of a countermeasure against the Belt and Road Initiative. But as time goes, there are some kind of overlap of interest, not the entirely, but the some of the overlap. And then Chinese BRI is under the uh, phase of uh, readjustment. At the same time, Japan's like a FOIP is still an uh, ongoing developing concept. And uh, you can see some of the kind of uh, uh, convergence of interest in it. That's the second point. And the third point would be, having said that, both like uh, top leaders, Xi Jinping, as well as Abe, Shinzo Abe, uh, face many, many difficult challenges. So like uh, we have to see uh, they have uh, many obstacles ahead. Those are kind of three points I just want to make. Okay. Um, actually, today, the Japanese uh, Prime Minister is uh, Shinzo Abe. And then I think Japan has been famous for uh, changing prime ministers almost annually uh, after uh, Mr. Koizumi stepped down in 2006. After that, almost every year, September was the time that the Japanese prime minister changes, almost. But every year, uh, we had the new prime ministers. But um, when uh, Mr. Abe came into power in December 2012, actually, it was his second administration. It was not his first time. As uh, you can see, uh, his first administration was uh, from September 2006 to September 2007, just one year. After that, uh, we have seen a kind of rotation of like uh, five prime ministers. And then again, uh, 2000, uh, December 2012, uh, Mr. Abe came into power, right? But uh, after that, even up to the moment, uh, Abe is very interesting because he is the long ser longest serving Japanese prime minister in the modern Japanese history. So like, uh, he served more than seven years. It's, um, if you look at the Japanese uh, prime minister for the last 10 years, that is really exceptional. And uh, as long as something uh, unexpected happens, his administration is likely to continue at least until September 2021. So like, uh, almost like uh, another, another one year and a half. So like, um, I think his administration administration could be really, really long. It's a kind of, so in that sense, uh, we are in a kind of ex exceptional stage, a very interesting moment. Anyway, uh, the Abe administration has uh, tried to improve like um, its relations with China. And then during the first administration, Hu Jintao, former Chinese president, and also Mr. Abe, decided to pursue mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interests. And then again, once his uh, second administration started, uh, he tried to improve the bilateral relations. Unfortunately, for the first two years, from uh, 2012 to 2014, there had, no, had no summit meeting between uh, Xi Jinping and Abe. Two years, no kind of direct top level uh, channel. But uh, November uh, 2014 was the first time that uh, they had a summit meeting. At the time, it was held on the sideline of uh, APEC multilateral meeting. But anyway, that was the first point. Since then, 
uh, both leaders have uh, held uh, two, uh, 12 times like summit meeting, 12 summit meeting. And the latest one is uh, back in December last year in Chengdu, China, uh, they have a summit meeting, uh, making use of the occasion of trilateral summit meetings among Japan, China, and South Korea. In any way, 12 meetings, that's a kind of good figures. So like now you can see, at least like uh, bilateral, uh, like uh, top level meetings have been convened like uh, several times for a year. And this, these two pictures show you, you know, where we were and where we are now. Can you see any differences? <laughs> yeah, at least, like, uh, you know, you could see, uh, at least, like, uh, Mr. C is smiling, and also you could see, like, uh, uh, two national flags behind them and a couple of, you know, new development. At least, like, um, you can see, this is uh, very interesting, but you can, this is a process. <laughs> I have to quickly go over, but uh, if you are interested, I will show you more later. In any case, uh, this is um, where we are at the kind of... Um, high level. And then I think uh, one of the turning points in bilateral relations was in October 2018. It was the occasion that uh, Prime Minister Abe visited Beijing to have a bilateral summit meeting. At the time, it was a good timing because it commemorated 40th anniversary of Japan, China, peace treaty, that was originally signed in 1978. So like a 40th anniversary of peace treaty. That was in October 2018. Since then, Abe and C tried to bring the bilateral relations to a new level. And then I think this uh, good momentum uh, continued. And then uh, here is a kind of a simple uh, statement. But uh, last year in 2019, Japan hosted G20 in June in Osaka. And at that time, Xi Jinping came to Japan. And this year, Japan will host Olympic Games in summer. And now, I think it's almost certain that Mr. Xi uh, makes his first state visit to Japan this spring. So uh, in maybe three, four months, uh, Mr. Xi is, will be coming to Tokyo. That would be a very big uh, moment for the bilateral relations. Because if he comes, shuttle diplomacy, meaning like a mutual visit by top leaders annually, will restart since 2018. Like in 2018, uh, like it's Abe visited, and last year uh, Xi Jinping came, and this year again uh, Xi Jinping came, uh, comes, and then you know you see a kind of good momentum continues. And as you know, 2022 uh, China is going to host you know, Olympic game. In winter Olympic game in Beijing. Again, that would be another moment maybe Japanese Prime Minister will go. In any case, uh, these are top level uh, you know, relations. And then those relations are really important. At the same time, we should understand that for Japan, China is one of the most important partners in terms of trade. And if you look at this chart, US, Italy, and Japan, the top part is US, the middle part is Italy, and the last part is Japan. But my kind of point is, those yellow parts, meaning China is the top trading partner. And if you can look at the chart, for instance, in 2018, China was most important trading partner, both in terms of imports and exports for Japan. So like a top partner for Japan in terms of trade was China. And almost the same situation as for the United States. But Italy, totally different. So like, uh, you know, Japan is more dependent on China than Italy is, in any case. Also, China is uh, dependent on Japan than Italy does. So in that sense, like, uh, even economic relations, you know, China has been a very important partner. This is a kind of chart of Chinese exports. The blue, you know, line is Japan. In other words, for China, Japan is the third important uh, market for Chinese products. The third, third. And as for imports, again, um, the blue line is Japan. You can see Japan is the second important importer for China. So you can see how those like, economies are mutually dependent. And also, as for the public opinion, um, I would like to show you, I uh, introduced one interesting survey. Maybe you know that in China, it's really difficult to conduct public opinion in the PRC. But uh, there's one official, somewhat semi-official 
uh, like an uh, opinion poll conducted uh, by Japanese NPO called the Genron NPO. It's a non-partisan uh, institution. And also China Daily is a Chinese media. Uh, they work together to conduct a survey at the same, same time, both in Japan and in China, and from 2005 to the present. So you will see a kind of a nice time series analysis. And this um, NPO published data in English as well. So if you are interested, please go to the website. You could get the detailed information on the joint survey in English as well. Of course, in Japanese and in Chinese. But in any case, um, this is a, I will show you the latest results briefly. And this is a um, kind of a um, poll conducted in September 2019. And uh, those like, uh, respondents are above 18 years old. And the education levels are somewhat similar. And uh, 1,000 responses from Japan and 1,600 responses from China. So it's a good num number. And this is the chart you can I, I would like to briefly highlight. It's an um, impression of one another's country that are asking Japanese respondent what's the impression of China and they are vice versa. And if you look at this chart, this like a red line on the top is a Japanese public opinion uh, who see China unfavorably. So you can see very high you know, portion of Japanese people see China unfavorably. And then if we look at um, the gray line, it's a second from the bottom, the gray line, it's a Chinese public opinion seeing Japan favorably. So like, um, Chinese people tend to have a more positive view on Japan than the others. So it's like a somewhat looks a little different from what we imagine. But I think um, public opinion of Japan is somewhat really uh, severe than that from China. In any case, uh, these are very interesting results you could look at on the web. But some of the reasons I just want to highlight. A favorable impression of the other countries. The top one, the black letters are Japan. And the bottom one, red letters China. Both like um, increased familiarity and interest in traditional Chinese culture and history. Improved living standards in China. Those are Japanese answers. And then remarkable growth of Japan's economy. Japan's beautiful environment and landscape, high quality of Japanese product are the Chinese answers for having you know, favorable opinion. And more interestingly, uh, reasons for unfavorable impression are uh, more uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, like um, the top one, uh, situation surrounding the Senkaku Islands and the different political system between Japan and China, action going against international rules those are the top three reasons why Japanese public see China unfavorably. And in contrast, Japan's lack of proper apology and remorse, and Japan's nationalization of the Liaoyu Islands. Liaoyu Island is a Chinese, Chinese name of the Senkaku Island. And Senkaku Island, just want, I just want to highlight, but it's a you know, part of Japanese territory, but China has totally different ideas, unfortunately. So like they use the Liaoyu Island for their name. And also the Japan's attempt to encircle China with the US. So these are the Chinese perceptions. So you can see uh, there are many other reasons, but um, I just highlight the top three. So this, and also like obstacles for to building better China-Japan relations, somewhat similar you know, elements. So these are the kind of uh, public image of uh, the other country. And this chart shows you a kind of it's also another interesting survey uh, conducted by Japan Bank of International Corporation, a policy, Jap policy bank, and which asked Japanese business people which countries are most promising in the mid-term, the three, five years. As you can see, the blue one is China. So like China has been the top, you know, most popular destination for Japanese business for long. So like even though the Japan's perception General public perception is somewhat mixed, but you can see business, you know, China has been a really, really important partner. Interestingly, last this year, last year, 2019, China dropped the second rank. The first rank, it's still small, but uh, it was India. So nowadays, India and Japan, uh, India and China are top two most attractive destinations for Japanese business. So India is very another promising area. But anyway, today, you know, we don't want to cover 
you know, India. But and again, so now you have a very basic idea of where we are in terms of bilateral relations. And then I just want to briefly talk about free and open in the Pacific. And of course, some of you are very familiar with this concept. So this uh, chart shows the gist of the free and open in the Pacific initiative. We say FOIP, sometimes I call FOIP uh, as abbreviation. And there are, the FOIP has three pillars, right? First one is rule of law, freedom of navigation, market economy. And second pillar, economic prosperity and interconnectivity. And third one, peace and stability. So like, uh, those like um, the basic idea that uh, FOIP has is um, very, uh, I think this is really um, what like, uh, many uh, democratic countries endorse. And then um, this uh, is um, sometimes like um, uh, assumed as a countermeasure against uh, China's uh, DRI. But uh, some of the parts, like uh, interconnectivity, for instance, and peace and stability, right? and economic prosperity are exactly what DRI tries to pursue, even though different ways of ideas, different measures. But uh, some of the ultimate objectives actually we share in common. So it's not necessarily like you know, competing against each other. Some of the parts definitely are different. But um, especially uh, since 2017, I think we are in a very interesting age in terms of BRI and FOIP because uh, in June 2017, it was a time that the Japanese Prime Minister Abe uh, identified four conditions to cooperate with China in terms of BRI. So like, uh, he didn't uh, like oppose the BRI itself anymore. He just uh, identified the conditions. And those four conditions are somewhat obvious, but uh, for instance, the first one is open infrastructure. In other words, people can use infrastructure, and uh, you know, infrastructure cannot be excludable, in a sense, open infrastructure. And second one is fair and transparent uh, procurement. So like a procurement process should be transparent and fair. In other not only Chinese companies, but also other companies can join the you know, bending process and so forth, that, and including Japanese companies. And also the third one is economically viable projects. So if the projects are infeasible, then it's not necessarily good to implement. So like economically viable projects. And also like uh, uh, fair and uh, sound uh, fiscal situation. In other words, fiscal sustainability, that's the fourth condition. So as long as Chinese projects satisfy these four conditions, Abe said Japan can cooperate. So that was 2017. And the last year, 2019, actually, when China hosted the second Belt and Road Initiative Forum in Beijing, uh, Xi Jinping delivered a speech. And he used the term high quality economic cooperation that BRI is going to pursue high quality cooperation. That was the first time he mentioned that way. So now the Xi Jinping also worries about the quality of BRI project and high quality and also the Abe's four conditions somewhat overlap. So like now I think my view is now we are in, in the age of uh, BRI 2.0 and uh, China is uh, making some adjustments. At the same time, even though Xi Jinping wants to modify the BRI, how it plays out is a very difficult question because China is a, such a big country and also BRI is not initiated by Chinese government itself, right? The, the Chinese companies are the major driving force behind the BRI. So like, even if the Communist Party has some idea, sometimes it's difficult that uh, those like, uh, you know, policy is implemented on the ground. So like, uh, there's a lot of uh, difficulty implementing Xi Jinping's idea, but anyway, we have to see a reality check how far China can do. But uh, some of the idea China mentioned overlaps Japan's idea of a FOIP. And these are kind of main points. And then, uh, of course, I don't want to spend so much time talking about uh, uh, the detailed you know, challenges, but I just want to highlight. Both like uh, Xi Jinping and Abe now uh, have some difficulty. Uh, and then any top leaders have difficulties, but as for like uh, Xi Jinping, Ah, Xi, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Xi Jinping has, um, for instance, um, like um, you know, to trade deal with the United States. Uh, that's uh, really uh, difficult. 
issue for him, right? And also, like, uh, economic slowdown is a kind of an obvious fact. 6.0% economic growth sounds really great to Japan, actually, and perhaps maybe great to Italy. But uh, in China, 6% economic growth is not something they can be proud of. They used to be have uh, more than 10% economic growth, and it's almost like a half. And then economic, high economic growth is the source of legitimacy of the uh, Chinese Communist Party's rule nowadays. So like, uh, that's a uh, really key issue uh, CCP leaders want to maintain. And then again, also since last year, all of a sudden, uh, like uh, in Hong Kong, uh, demonstration started. And uh, that was a big challenge for Xi Jinping and also for the kind of uh, Hong Kong leaders as well. But uh, how to deal with this Hong Kong protest is a very big challenge for Xi. And as you know, just a few, a few weeks ago in Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen was re-elected. That was not a favorable candidate for the Chinese Communist Party. And as you know, that Xi, uh, Tsai Ing-wen actually was not that popular, but only because, uh, just my observation, but the biggest reason why she was uh, why Tsai was re-elected was a Hong Kong demonstration. And then, I didn't write, but as you know, now China is suffering from a new uh, coronavirus outbreak. It, it did not, it, it all came all of a sudden, but it's a big challenge to Xi Jinping. It could somewhat undermine his leadership if he makes some mistakes. But now, like, he has so many uh, challenges. And uh, as for Abe, uh, again, uh, he also has many challenges. The first one is like a FOIP itself. In Japan, among the like, academic circle, we, we uh, have a kind of debate. What is FOIP, actually? FOIP is not necessarily a clear-cut, straightforward concept. And some people say FOIP is a concept, and some people say it's an initiative, and someone even say it's a strategy. So, so it's some kind of a debate going on inside the Japanese academic circle, not like a policy, and, uh, policy people, but more like academic circle, what does it mean? But it's an interesting initiative because Japan has not been uh, quiet. You know, they, they, we, Japan doesn't uh, um, have this kind of big idea for a while. So like a FOIP is a very interesting case, but uh, it's a still uh, kind of uh, undergoing uh, concept or initiative. So like um, we have to, you know, think about it more in depth. And also like, um, it also has difficulty in implementing FOIP itself because FOIP is not something that the government can do, but it's like a private money, and the Japanese companies are also important uh, driving force behind FOIP. But how to attract private company, how to attract private capital, a big challenge for the Japanese government. Uh, Japan is, is not China. We don't have like a state-owned enterprises which you know can do whatever. Uh, communist Party order, so in that sense, different. And also, like, uh, even though Sino-Japanese relation has been stable, uh, both countries have some problems trying to identify a kind of actual concrete case of Japan-China economic cooperation in the third country. Actually, 52 memorandum was signed when Abe visited China in October 2018 to have Sino-Japan cooperation in third countries. So, so it's a nice showcase to um, highlight the kind of BRI and the FOIP cooperate each other. But uh, up to this moment, as far as I know, there's no concrete uh, pro kind of project yet. Maybe you might see some new project when Mr. Xi will visit Japan. I'm not sure, but uh, it's a kind of interesting moment to see. And also, lastly, uh, it's too early to talk about post Abe. <laughs> But uh, of course, we have to see the reality. And maybe September 2021, after that, who would be the successor? That's a really big challenge for Japan. Because Abe administration is such a long administration, a record-breaking administration, then someone after him would be uh, really, really uh, fa facing, will face a big challenge in any way. So Japan has also, uh, important but uh, difficult challenges. So having now like I just want to uh, give you some concluding remarks as a spring board for further discussion. Uh, the Indo-Pacific faces many challenges for strengthening the regional order, that's obvious. But uh, BRI is now at a turning point and I think FOIP is also a flexible concept 
and also it's uh, still developing. And then I didn't mention up to this moment President Trump, but uh, that's you know, something like I cannot you know, ignore. I don't want to you know, argue about it, but anyway, I should say something. And I would say President Trump is the wild card. He could change the entire landscape all of a sudden. I'm not sure how you see his, re his possibility to be elected, but uh, in Japan, as far as I know, majority view believe that again, he, President Trump will be, you know, will serve for the next four years. That's a kind of a current, you know, observation. And then in any case, how BRI and FOIP coexist in the region affects the future of the Indo-Pacific. And perhaps high quality infrastructure is a kind of solution that uh, which, you know, BRI and FOIP coexist, given that Xi Jinping's speech uh, like um, aiming for high economic, high quality economic cooperation under the BRI. So, because of the time, I just uh, talk briefly about several issues, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Watanabe. I have um, three brief uh, questions for you, and then uh, we can have a question from the public. Uh, the first one is about the uh, relation between China, Japan, and South Korea. And my question is, uh, can China uh, replace the U.S. as a negotiator between China, between Japan and South Korea. And the um, second question is about the coronavirus uh, and on the, the challenge that the Xi Jinping government is facing. Uh, how much can affect also the relation uh, among the East Asian countries because uh, you know, for the, the, the tourism in Japan is depending on, on tourism from, from China, so. And the third question is about FOIP. Um, in the last year, last, that is two years, I, 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 I recognize that Japan is uh, setting an agenda on, on, on the, about the relation with China, how to deal with China. Japan has the answer and FOIP can be an answer, uh, but the power of the Belt and Road uh, actually in, 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 uh, in the European countries uh, uh, mainly is, is about soft power. But the Japan is not challenging the Belt and Road on the soft power uh, sector, like, I don't know, facing uh, uh, big ceremonies and uh, mm, I, don't know, I don't know what changed actually in 2019 uh, in the relation between the European countries and China, but something changed. And China was the most recognizable country in East Asia. So if Japan is trying to uh, give us, a, okay, it's not an alternative, but actually is an alternative <laughs> with FOIP, what, what is missing? Uh, I don't know, state visits or more more presence of Japan in Europe, in the European countries. Why we are talking, we always talk about the uh, Chinese 5G, but we never talk about, for example, uh, Japanese or South Korean technology on 5G. Uh, and uh, I don't know, that's, that's, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting questions. The first one, uh, among the trilateral relations like Japan, China, South Korea, can China play the role of the United States, right? And then I don't think, um, you know, in a US, US role means like um, trying to cultivate good relations or become a, okay, like um, if like a Japan, South Korea relations are bad, and then U.S. intervene, but that's kind of role China yeah. plays, right? I don't think uh, China, I think China is maybe willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Like one day, I was um, asked by some Chinese um, academic who had a uh, influence in the policy circle in China, and that it was uh, the last December, uh, last November, when like uh, still Japan, South Korea relations had been bad. What kind of things China can play to, you know, facilitate the bilateral relations? I was shocked to, to hear his kind of question. But anyway, China is now 
it's, it indicated that at that time, China was thinking some ways that uh, you know, China can play a role of the United States in Asia, maybe, as you answer as you question. But um, I think that China, Japan, South Korea are kind of a very important like stakeholders. And then like, um, it's like um, China has its own problem. And then China-Japanese relations, or even China-South Korea relations. And then I don't think um, China can play uh, kind of a US law, which is a little bit distant, and they try to uh, take things that neutral. So like, um, it's like um, China is a very important critical stakeholder. And then our job is to try to uh, stabilize the bilateral relations. Interestingly, if you think about the trilateral relations, Japan, South Korea, and uh, China, there are three bilateral relations, right? Japan, China, and China, South Korea, and South Korea, China. And I noticed uh, so far, one of the three bilateral relations have been strained, have been severe. I mean, there, we haven't seen timing when all three bilateral relations are good, right? It's like a it's very really strange. It's not a causality, but uh, somehow you cannot have a very really stable <laughs> three bilateral relation up to this moment. So in that sense, like uh, China is a very important stakeholder, but China cannot be a neutral, you know, kind of intermediator, I would say. And as for the coronavirus, that's a really, really hard uh, uh, situation China is facing. And it's not, uh, it came o all of a sudden. And I think it's not a Chinese problem anymore. It's, I think, a global issue. And then, like, uh, international you know, society should cooperate. And then, of course, uh, economically, uh, for instance, as you mentioned, Japan uh, receives so many tourists from Japan, about 10 million people a year. So, like, uh, that would, uh, if we don't have uh, Chinese tourists because of the, this new, you know, coronavirus outbreak, definitely, uh, like, a Japanese economy will hit severely and then uh, will become a very, receive negative influence in terms of economy. At the same time, I noticed, I did, I did a report, uh, one of the Japanese media uh, talking about uh, Japan's SDF, self-defense forces, are now ready to go to China to assist if they are requested. So like, um, I think uh, this is a um, really sad situation, but uh, in a strange way, it's a kind of good momentum, a good opportunity, a good timing for like uh, Japan to cooperate with China somehow and show Japan's willingness. So uh, it could further improve the bilateral relations if you know this is handled nicely. And also, not only Japan, but also other countries as well, I think. And uh, it's easy to criticize China by looking at some actions but uh, China is a very complex country, difficult country. If uh, China is severely criticized, it's really hard for China to change its course. So like, um, you know, in order to have a cooperative attitude, you know, coming from China, we have to be very nuanced and we have to be nice too. So like, I think this is a nice case to show our willingness to engage in China in a very healthy way. And the third one, what your question is, uh, what's that? That's hope. Hope, right. And Japan and South Korea, what is that? Ah, yes, uh, Jap Japan's hope and China's BRI. And then Europe, in Europe, like, um, you know, people are talking about China, but unfortunately not Japan, right? So what is missing? What kind of strategy Japan can take? Uh, that's actually, I want to ask your advice, right? <laughs> but uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, or no, for, I don't know, but uh, if um, you hear stories about China in Europe, I don't think those stories are always positive, right? Like 5Gs or some kind of criticism, like investment. So like, I don't know. Talking about China here is, in a sense, good, because China becomes famous. But at the same time, the content of the talk is not necessarily positive. Then if um, Japan was in the position of China, I don't think that's a really ideal situation, right? So like nothing serious happens, that's why people don't talk about Japan. Th uh, people don't criticize Japan. If that's the case, it's not bad. But uh, having said that, it would be very nice people in Europe are interested in Japan. 
Well, so I, I would like to ask you questions or ask you an, an answers or suggestions, like <laughs> rather, because I just came here two days ago <laughs> and uh, I'm familiar with the situation in Europe, but um, what is missing, but maybe that's a very important question for the panel, I think. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, yes, please. Thank you, Watanabe-san. Uh, Francesco Gaglietti. I have one question for you. Do you think that um, uh, the, the, the overall outside perception is that the FOIP is still in its infancy, in its early stages? As you say, it's not even clear whether it's a, uh, a concept, uh, a strategy, an initiative. Uh, but um, um, seen from outside, it's still a very small club. Uh, Japan, Australia, the States, the UK, um, what is visible is that it's a democratic club uh, as opposed to a mainly, largely uh, authoritarian uh, community which is the uh, BRI community. So the, the, the differences are very conspicuous. What is not clear, however, is whether there is a willingness of the current club members to extend an invitation to Europe or to select the uh, European partners. Um, I'm not sure this invitation has ever been uh, uh, made uh, to Italy. Uh, Italy is, uh, thrives on export, on trade. It's a global trading uh, power. Uh, we have a vital interest in protecting sea lanes in particular so that our merchandise goods can arrive anywhere. So in theory, at least on the maritime part, which is a big component there, we could be interested. And, uh, but of course, things have become very complicated. The Mediterranean is, well, it has Chinese uh, presence and, uh, and uh, fingerprints everywhere these days. So I'm not sure, uh, the question is, do you think that uh, FOIP will become a bigger club than it is today? I is there such an idea? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting question. And then, um, FOIP, I, I, yes, um, I think um, BRI and FOIP some has, have something in common and some differences as well. And BRI, China is uh, somewhat uh, uh, really enthusiastic about extending invitation to BRI and the BRI members and not, as in the case of AIIB, you know, whether or not a country joins AI, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank or not. So those like a membership uh, invitation that sometimes uh, China really emphasize. But I don't think FOIP is that. It's more like an inclusive initiative. And it's not whether you join or you don't join. That's not, that's not that kind of things. It's not like a club thing. But having said that, I can see like core kind of uh, participants or like a core drivers look like Japan, US, and Australia, and now it's India core. And also like uh, nowadays, like some European countries like uh, UK and also France are somewhat uh, interested in this initiative. But uh, it's more like um, it's up to other countries how to make use of FOIP rather than like a FOIP decide which country is a member or not. And then and also if you look at the you know, documents talking about the FOIP, you will not find any kind of term like value. You know, it's not like a value diplomacy type argument, you know whether only democratic countries can join or it's not, not the kind, that kind of value part I don't think I find in like a FOIP related document. I think it's uh, more like, um, you know, initiative, but uh, it's a, uh, Japan's version of FOIP is emphasizing the economic development. Like if like uh, some countries want to, parti not participate, but uh, someone engage in some project, then they can, you know, just, uh, come and do whatever. It's not like a membership, that's my understanding. And also, my question is, I, if like, le let's assume that, that, for instance, Mr. Abe comes to Italy and uh, ask um, the current uh, Conte administration, do you want to engage in like a FOIP? If uh, he asks, what would be Italian's answer? <laughs> you know, is that he, he already asked, uh, he already asked and he already answered. Okay. Yes, sure, we are, we are in, okay. no problem. Okay. So, <laughs> but it, it was like four mm -hmm. months after sign the PRA, okay. so, so mm -hmm. was some kind of strange to enjoy the, the PRA and, uh, and 
Max and Joy also the poet. Strange situation in Italy. <laughs> so okay, there's no M MOU involved, right? In case no, of FOIP. No. But China's case, like MOU signing and then making a kind of a membership. So it's a somewhat different, right? Okay, thank you. More questions? Please. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Even though I said that like, FOIP and uh, BRI have uh, something in common, one of the differences, the major difference is, is like a security field. And the freedom of navigation definitely is something that Japan doesn't want to make, pro uh, make uh, compromise. And uh, I don't think uh, that's a pre that issue, they have any agreements. But at, at least like, um, I think they understand that at least they should avoid unexpected incidents or something like that, right? But uh, beyond, I'm, beyond that, I, I don't think they reach any consensus on that. It's like uh, there are some kind of differences as well, of course, right? Thank you. Please. Uh, Professor Watanabe, um, I'm very interesting that um, the uh, attitude uh, towards each other uh, country is uh, uh, determined by the cultural issues. And uh, first of all, the, the favorable impressions are about uh, the um, ancient history of the China and the um, rec recent uh, cultural issues of the Japan culture. But the, the unfavorable questions are about the, the history of the 20th century. So it's very interesting to me to understand about uh, the um, possible solutions of the, um, the quarrel between China and Japan on the history of the 20th century. Because in Italy we have uh, uh, just a very far echo of the uh, the debate uh, in, in the Far uh, East Asia. And uh, it, it, I'm an historian, so I'm very interested in this, uh, this problem, this question. Thank you so much. Your question is, is there any solution? For yes, a, a solution uh, of the, oh, mm, well, uh, if there are some uh, um, tent, uh, attempts to uh, uh, some uh, in the 19, uh, uh, yeah, in uh, five years ago, there were a, um, a big conference in the East Asia about uh, uh, recent history, and the conclusion was that uh, uh, they agree that uh, they uh, not agree about uh, the, the history of the 20th century. Uh, so. Uh, there are uh, some uh, step towards or simply uh, they mm, agree to don't speak about the 20th century and then uh, concentrate them on the uh, more ancient history or recent history. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. History is, is really difficult, especially between Japan and China. And then like um, if um, either side handled this question wrongly, then it always comes back to the, you know, current bilateral relations and then sometimes it totally um, kind of destroys kind of a cooperative atmosphere. But now today's situation is, as um, I think, uh, just my observation or understanding, but uh, both sides try not to treat, uh, not to make the history issue Dominant, dominate the entire bilateral relations. Even though we understand there are issues which are really hard to solve, and then both of the perception, 
different widely, differ widely, and then it's really hard to reach consensus. And uh, how to under how to understand history, you know, how can I say, Chinese history and the Japanese history do not necessarily the same, even though we are talking about the same kind of in incident. But uh, having said that, and there are kind of a joint uh, effort among both countries' scholars to do kind of research and they publish a couple of their, you know, interpretation of a specific event. There's a kind of joint research already taking place, but uh, still, you know, that's a kind of sideline of the bilateralization and how to uh, avoid the history issues dictate the bilateral relations. That's that kind of state now I think we are in. But as, I, as you said, I think it's really important you know, issues and then we have to take several steps to, you know, and uh, I don't think these steps will solve the issue you know, dramatically, but uh, yeah, we have to keep, you know, make efforts. And uh, some of the efforts are actually taking place, but very, very slow going. As for the kind of joint research, even though Chinese top scholars on history and the Japanese top scholars history uh, cooperate and do like um, conduct uh, you know, several year uh, like um, joint you know, research. And then actually they produce like uh, outcomes, like uh, some kind of papers. And then in Japan, their products are mostly published. But the same one was supposed to be published in China, in Chinese, but that side, China stopped. It was too controversial for China to, you know, open the debate to the public. So that even though the you know, research was there, but uh, in China it was not read. So that's still simple, quite joint research still is at this stage. So it's really difficult. Uh, it, we have to go so many steps, I guess. Right, thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question. Mm, okay. I want to intervene. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Hello, uh, Melanie Kuo from Taipei Representative Office in Italy. Uh, I'm actually going to take this opportunity to reflect on one of the comments that was made before and then uh, post um, another question. Uh, so um, we, I did hear uh, Professor Watanabe commenting on uh, President Tsai's re-election in Taiwan a couple of weeks back, saying that it's, um, well, kind of due to Hong Kong protest, which is true in... Um, in a sense, however, it is not, um, basically, I think it tells the young generation because the, uh, the influence is really on the young generation, having witnessed what is happening in, well, let's say it is not the Hong Kong protest that helped uh, Tsai to win the election, uh, win the votes from the young people. It's actually the government or police handling of the situation, uh, reminding or telling the Taiwanese young generation that uh, the one country, two system is really not something that they can trust or have any uh, slightest hope on. That I'm commenting on the younger generation where other groups of people think differently in my country. But eventually that kind of um, made possible to a 75% uh, turnout of the vote. And that kind of changes um, the course of the election. Um, I have a question concerning the BRI and the, uh, the FOIP because um, in well, in p part in Europe, for example, uh, China has been investing a lot uh, in, in Central Eastern Europe uh, in uh, through the BRI projects in infrastructure. So they've been investing on uh, the construction of high-speed rails for Central European countries and all that. But um, the implement uh, the implement and also the decrease of um, investment or the thing that was promised but not actually re realized um, the way it was promised is also causing um, doubt in. Central Eastern Europe um, about how reliable um, the BRI is, uh, or is, it, or is it actually something that um, we can all put our hope in? So, in the in the in the sense that I mean, in the situation, if in the in, in the coming few years uh, the BRI is slowing down, if it's proven that um, people don't want to work so closely with China anymore, do you think Japan is ready uh, to take over? Uh, using FOIP to substitute BRI. Thank you very much. Well, first, uh, thank you very much for your comment on like a th um, Ms. Tai's you know, re-election. It's more like a clarification that helps us a lot. And as for the question whether Japan is ready to take over the, over the role of uh, China, but um, I don't think uh, that's possible because um, you know, scale is so different. 
but uh, perhaps what Japan can do is uh, try to maintain the high quality, the level of you know infrastructure, and then like a pick up project that satisfy you know that kind of conditions, and then uh, Japanese you know funded project, maybe some of the new project Japan can fund, and then that would be beneficial for like developing countries having a high quality, durable you know infrastructure. And then with like um, um, somewhat like um, beneficial conditions of like loans uh, coming from Japan, and maybe not only Japan but also other multilateral financial institutions like uh, ADB or like World Bank and so forth. So like uh, some of the project, good co good projects Japan can do, but because the money is somewhat limited, and then we cannot do the same thing as China's BRI has done. At the same time, I don't think Japan should do exactly what China has done. And then, uh, or like um, Japan should, you know, show some kind of uh, standards, high standards that uh, what those projects are supposed to be. And then like um, uh, somewhat give advice to like uh, developing countries not to, uh, not to spend so much money, even if uh, it money is offered from China or other countries, if it is not useful for their own economic development. So in a sense, like um, too much projects sometimes is more counterproductive to you know economic development in the country. At this moment, it's OK to have a lot of infrastructure. But those infrastructures are not for free. Right? It's like in that sense, like um, it costs later much. So in that sense, like um, in any case, uh, I don't think Japan can take a role of China. And I don't think Japan have to. Okay, so thank you. Ah, bye, 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 bye. Th no, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Julie, of course. Thank you, Professor Watanabe, for this interesting uh, lecture. Uh, hopefully, uh, this was only the first step, the first occasion to setting the record straight to for a better understanding about uh, uh, VRI, about uh, FOIP. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am especially thankful to Embassy of uh, Japan in Rome and see you uh, to next uh, uh, our next uh, events.